Welcome to Disciples Net Church. We are so glad you've joined us for worship. Feel free to join in with hymns, pray with us, and share in communion. Wherever and whenever you are joining us, God's Spirit and people from all over the world are here with you. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield, to you. Silver only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You Hello, I'm Pastor Carolyn Miller. Will you join me in prayer? Abiding God, we are so grateful for your presence and your grace for yet another day. Be with us as we move through each part of our day. Help us to see Christ within each person we encounter. Be with us, be present in each encounter, and help us to be your hands and your feet, your love and your grace to all that we meet. Be with us in all our days and in all our ways, so that what we do may spread your message and bring glory to your name, now and forevermore. And now, let us say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. The basis for our thinking together comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. The reading begins with uh, verse 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when Jairus saw Jesus, fell at Jesus' feet and begged Jesus repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with Jairus. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, 
you see the crowd pressing in on you, how can you say, who touched my clothes? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talithia kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was about twelve years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. And he strictly ordered them that no one should know about this. And then he told them to give her something to eat. There are so many layers of meaning in these two stories sandwiched together as they are. The larger story of Jairus and his little daughter and the interior story of the woman with the issue of blood. Because there are so many layers of possibility, a preacher really needs to focus on one aspect of this story in order to make the sermon of a manageable length. So right now I want to focus on one aspect of this material, and that is the question why we have the insertion of the woman with the issue of blood into the two parts of the story of Jairus. And I want to get to that question by asking you about two or three situations in life. Have you ever been watching an athletic contest, U.S. football, football as it is known in the rest of the world, but known in the U.S. as soccer, and your team is near the end, the game is winding down, and your team has the ball, but they still need to score to win, and you see that clock flashing, and you see that ball flashing across the field, and you wonder, Will there be enough time to score? You can feel the tension inside. These kinds of things happen in more serious circumstances, too. Our family lives right up the street from where an ambulance goes out on its runs, and often we can hear that ambulance leave its ambulance house, and my wife and I wonder, will there be enough time can the ambulance get there and get the patient and get to the hospital in time? And even in other situations, things are happening, developments are taking place. We hope for one outcome, but if it doesn't come, there may be another, and we wonder if there will be enough time for the good to happen. I think that is exactly the situation that we have in regard to the relationship between these two stories. As the section of Scripture opens, Jesus is by the sea, 
And often in the Bible, the presence of the sea invokes in the background of the reader's mind the awareness of chaos, of uncertainty, of tension. And even though that is not a heavy-handed aspect of the symbolism here, you just notice that this series of events start in the presence of a symbol that is often associated with tension and even the possibility of chaos. Jesus is there when Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, meaning a respected leader, the equivalent of a lay leader, an elder, something like that in a congregation comes to him and wants Jesus to return with Jairus to Jairus' house because Jairus' daughter, as he says, is at the point of death. Can you feel that tension? You can just feel if something doesn't happen soon, we are going to be in the presence of death. And it gives you the sense of wanting to do everything possible to bring the life-saving mechanisms to bear on this person, on this situation. We turn with Jesus, Jairus, and the crowd to go to Jairus' house with this feeling of urgency, will we get there in time? When a woman comes up in the crowd with a hemorrhage, we don't know really what medical condition this is, except that it has to do with a flow of blood. She wants to be made whole. She presses her way through the crowd. She reaches out, never getting Jesus' attention before the act itself. She touches his cloak, more probably the ends of his prayer shawl, the zitzit. She reaches out, touches the hem of his garment, and is made whole. Now this is a courageous act, a dramatic moment, and it fills us with awe and admiration that a woman would do such a thing, except that we are on the way to Jairus' house. The forward movement of this little body of people has been stopped as Jesus tends to this woman. When he perceives that power has gone out from him, they stop, and he looks around and wants to know who touched him. She then comes forward, and the scripture says, tells the whole truth. After which he says to her, daughter, meaning that he feels a kinship with her, which was something very important in antiquity. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Your confidence that the power of the realm of God is operative in me, has made you well. Now, go in peace. You are healed of your disease. Courageous, inspiring, dramatic, but it has brought this procession to a halt. And as a reader, as much admiration as I have for this woman, the question has never stopped nagging at the back of my mind, will there be enough time? This is exactly the question, one of the questions, that was in the back of the readers of Mark's Gospel. You see, they lived at a dramatic moment in history when about the year 70, when the Romans had come down the Jordan River Valley, they had besieged Jerusalem, sacked the city, destroyed the temple, left Judaism in ruins, the priesthood, the Sadducees gone, many Jewish social institutions either collapsed or in danger of collapsing, economic uncertainty, social chaos, even violence, and everywhere the presence of the Roman army hanging over them a heavy fist. And their question is, given the circumstances in which we find ourselves, 
can we make it from this confused and chaotic situation to the second coming, which will bring with it the realm of God, the end of these chaotic and distressful situations, and the coming of a world in which God's values are absolute in every heart, in every relationship, and in every situation, And these are the values of love, peace, justice, mutual support, abundance, blessing between humankind and nature, the end of violence, and life eternal for everyone and everything. Can we make it from this desperate situation, like Jairus and his daughter, to the second coming and the arrival of of the realm. They feel like they are at a moment in history when they have been interrupted. When a woman, as it were, has come up out of the crowd of history and stands between them and the coming of the realm of God. Almost immediately, Jesus and his little group leave the woman behind fully blessed, fully healed, and they turn toward home. When they get to Jairus' house, the first thing they see is that they are, obviously, too late. They see mourners in the street. In those days, it was customary to have family and friends and even professional mourners in mourning garb with mourning instruments, wailing and making a great grief-filled sound in a public way. This accomplished two things. Number one, it was the obituary of antiquity. It announced the death. And number two, it was a way of beginning the process of grieving. That was a way of giving voice and vent to the grief, the loss, the great cry of despair that is in so many when death occurs. Well, the people of that day thought, nice of Jesus to come. He's here making the equivalent of a pastoral death call. He will offer some pastoral presence to Jairus and the family, gather them into prayer, and go on his way. But this is Jesus. This is the story of the coming of the realm of God this fantastic power that does not wait fully for the second coming, but is already here and operative in a partial way in the present. And so Jesus goes into the room with a small group of people, and he raises the little girl from the dead. And the last thing the text says is, feed her. Apparently, even in death, you get hungry. And she needs some food, some sustenance, some energy, because she is up, and she probably needs a little something in her to give her strength when she steps out of that room and the mourners faint with surprise. From Mark's point of view, one of the purposes of this story is to assure the community that no matter how they may feel about having an interruption between them and the future, no matter how great their sense of anxiety, no matter how profound their concern for the future, no matter how big their question marks, not to worry. With a power like Jesus in the world, it is not too late. They are going to make it from their moment in history to the realm of God. There will be anxiety. There will be signs of death represented by the mourners. There will be people who disbelieve. No matter Believe, which in Mark means 
have confidence that the realm of God is coming through Jesus, no matter how many questions, no matter how uncertain, look toward the future in hope because a Jesus who could raise a girl who was already dead is a Jesus who can return and bring the realm to its fullness. Now, of course, we cannot apply this teaching to every circumstance in life in which there is a question as to whether or not we will reach the end and get to certainty. I think when it comes to a football game, it doesn't usually matter whether we get the right kick in at the end in order to win the game. And there are other circumstances in life in which we don't get to the end in time as far as our earthly timetable is concerned. There are illnesses that simply bring about an end. There are relationships that we cannot save in time. But the bigger picture in this story is that what is an ending for us in our world is for God a part of a larger process that has not come to conclusion yet, and it is a process that is permeated by unconditional love, by unending desire for peace, by unrelenting will for justice, by a power of life that will not ultimately be turned back. Death may win in every individual case, but overall the power of life prevails. It is natural enough and healthy enough to feel grief when we lose a person certain other things, but within the larger picture of God's purposes, these do not have the last word. I am thinking now about congregations, so many that I know, that have been running down, as it were, for a long time, losing members, declining in social power, budgets shrinking. I remember 10, 15 years ago, I would visit congregations and I would think how much smaller they were than when I had visited them 10 or 15 years before. Now I visit some of these congregations and I wonder, how can you make it another Sunday? But the power of this text is to say to us, there is something at work here that you may not see, but that is bigger than you are and that has behind it the power of life and that points toward the second coming. So I would say to you, wherever you are in a situation of wondering whether there is enough time, whether it's dealing with an economic crisis, family member, a relationship, a church, a political witness, a situation that is on the edge of violence, where the power of Jesus is present, now and in the future, you should live in hope. Because just as he came to Jairus and raised that little girl when it looked like everything had run out, the same Jesus is there, present for you. Like the woman at the well I was seeking For things that could not satisfy And then I heard my Savior speaking Draw from my well that never shall run dry
The story we share today in worship reminds me of how important tiny little things sometimes are. How important a little extra sensitivity to what's going on around us might be in the lives of other people. How much it might mean to us if someone notices when we are in distress and offers to help. Now, none of us has the power to heal a physical illness in another person with just a word from our lips the way Jesus did. None of us can do that. But we can reach out in love and we can share. And I am reminded of that when we come to this table. This table is a moment of receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ into our very selves. It is also a moment of sharing family fellowship the way we do at a loving, happy meal. And so I invite us to come to the table in that spirit today reminding of ourselves about God and Jesus, also reminding ourselves how much we care about one another. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, grant as we come to this table today that we might be filled in spirit the way we are symbolically filled in body by eating and drinking. As we take these symbols, as we take them into ourselves, as we literally make them part of our own bodies, may our spirit be filled with your presence and your Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. And we are reminded by the Apostle Paul that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. All is now in readiness. Come to this blessed, blessed feast. <laughs> what time it is, regardless of the circumstances in which you find yourself, be assured that the love of God, the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit are yours now and always. Amen.